Thank you, Leslie. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Hope you're having a good and gentle welcome so far. Um, I'm going, my, my talk is about is titled Beyond Gutenberg, and I want to go over a bit um, how the past year has been for the project, um, and also dive a bit into some of the philosophical reasons for how some of the decisions uh, behind how Gutenberg works came about. And in case you haven't become familiar yet with Gutenberg, we have this page in the WordPress.org website. So first, quickly, it's, it was literally a year when we released the first version of the plugin at WordCamp Paris last year. And since then, we've done 30 releases. Uh, we've had more than 200 contributors, and there's been like three, over 3,000 code mergers. So one, one of the, the main challenges for approaching Gutenberg and how we could, um, so the goal was how can we bring a block-based editing experience to a really significant portion of the web um, without, without fragmenting the, the sort of the fabric of the content that uh, like WordPress is producing a lot of content for the web. And it was a, both a responsibility for us as a project to honor that longevity of content and be able to introduce the, this new notion of how, how a better experience for editing content could be uh, without, losing, with, without losing sight of that responsibility. So I, I made a post, I think, last year uh, that was titled um, re referring to the, the paradox of Theseus, uh, which says it's, it's mainly about how an object can be uh, transform entirely piece by piece uh, without, and, and whether the end result is the same object because you don't entirely notice the changes. Um, and this, is, uh, this was mainly targeted towards how we structure Gutenberg content. And one of our principles from the very start has been to optimize as much as possible for the user and to not let uh, data own the content that the user has. Um, what that means is we have to be very conscious that we, don't, we, we are building software that has already lasted 15 years, and it's going to last many more years in the future, hopefully. And we have to be, we have to be very careful about preserving the, both not locking users in into, the, into a platform and letting them take that content out if they need to. So that, that's one of the reasons why we uh, took a lot of time to figure out a way to introduce blocks under the same, the same content management system that WordPress has uh, without breaking that. The other thing is that uh, we had to have a, we really needed an incremental development pace. Like, again, we introduced the first version a year ago since then, you, at any point, you could install the plugin, and if it wasn't ready for you yet, you could uninstall it and continue on. In that process, we couldn't afford locking the content that you produce while using the plugin. Like you should be able to, like the content should not be a prisoner to these, to these tools. Um, and the other thing is a bit more fundamental. Like WordPress has stood up for the semantic web for since its very inception. Um, and that's something that Gutenberg needs to continue and carry forward. So we need to, the way, the way we have approached how block editing should work is that block editing is a concern of when you're manipulating the content, but it's not a concern when the content is output. So we're using, we're very attached to HTML, HTML as the output and as the source. What that means is that the, what the visitor is going to experience, that's what, in a way, that's what matters the most. And we need to figure out how to build tools that, that can allow you to produce these pages without forcing you to have a very specific data structure for powering them. And this, has, this also has a connection with the, the Gutenberg name itself. Like if you, if you imagine what a printing press produces, like the final page, 
you can't recreate the state that was before the page was produced, that is, like the, all the metal types from the page itself. But what is preserved through time is the actual page. That's what people are going to interact with. Uh, that's what users are going to value the most. Um, so what we, what we set out to do was to figure out a way to have the page as the sort of the, the privileged entity that you're dealing with and then figure out a way how to extract and how to infer and how to lift a more meaningful editing experience from it for the author of that page. So it's, imagine if like when you print a page, you could have sort of invisible marks that tells the machine how to set up like the printing press itself to have the metal types re rebuilt. And that's what the, these HTML comments came about. Uh, they are, they are really invisible markers that tells, that informs us what's the content there for an editing purpose. Like HTML has its own semantics for consumption. This is, this is marking that content in a way that we can tell very quickly which kind of blog we are dealing with. And this is important because we can have blogs that have exactly the same markup but they have different UIs, or they should have different UIs in the editing experience. Uh, an example could be uh, like a, an image could have a figure with an image tag, um, and we could have a blog that's about movie posters. And it's very specific about just, I don't know, searching the uh, movie database for movie posters, but the output is exactly the same. But we want to be able to deploy a different editing interface for the movie poster, even if the markup is the same. So that's, that's one of the main reasons um, tied to the fact that we want to make this tra a transparent and gradual adoption uh, for why this came about. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to touch on was that the notion of a block for us is it's like the block appears when you, when you need to manipulate the content, but then it sort of fades away. Um, and this is what this nice illustration tries to show, is that you, can, you have the final page, you can lift up this block, you can manipulate it in the editing context, and then it goes back into the final output that the page produces. So in a way, blocks for WordPress are like a slightly higher order HTML. Um, sometimes, it, and, and, this is, and to not confuse, like HTML has its inherent semantics. We're just using a native HTML tool, which is the content, to sort of declare something that's valuable for us as an editing platform. Um, I like another thing about blogs is that on the front end, we're actually not rendering the comments at this moment. So they are, they are completely invisible uh, in terms of um, in terms of affecting the final output. Like another advantage of them is uh, something that traveled shortcodes for a very long time was that if you were in a context where the shortcode couldn't be interpreted by WordPress, um, I don't know, an email client or an RSS reader, you often ended up with just the text representation of the shortcode, which is often a very bad experience. Uh, in, in this case, the, by the token markers being native to the language of the web, we can make sure that that doesn't leak into the user experience. The other thing is that block, a, a block is a, is a tool we use to manipulate the content, but how it stores the data, it's, it's, less, it's less relevant to the block itself. That means that, that there could be multiple ways in which a block saves data. And in, in Tammy's presentation before, I think there was a question about um, if blocks could save to meta. And that's already possible now. You can build a block that's actually displaying the page among all the other blocks, but the source of the data is in meta attributes. And th this is very flexible for the developer, and it, it, but it also puts a responsibility in when you're figuring out how you should structure a block, you should think about the user experience first and what's, what's the best way to deal with the user data. And what's the, way, the best way to fade away? That, that means what would happen if my plugin disappears? What would happen if the user 
uh, wants to move away from WordPress and they want to just copy the entire content of their post, would they have the integrity of their data when they want to do that? So it's, there's a responsibility on us all to think about these problems because they are, they are also design problems because they deal with the user data. The other thing is that blocks can be, we, we've talked many times about blocks being static and dynamic. Um, static blocks are the, most of the basic formatting blocks we have in Gutenberg and that everyone is used to even from the previous editor, that is text, um, text images, quotes, uh, galleries, uh, all, all, all of the basic elements. Dynamic blocks are those that need the server to process data before it can be displayed. Uh, the, probably the clearest example in Gutenberg is the latest post. That the latest post blocks needs to go and fetch the latest post from the database before being displayed. So it can save that as HTML because that's going to get uh, outdated fairly quickly. But there's, no, there's not a hard distinction between static and dynamic blocks. Like a static block can be turned into a dynamic block just by registering a render callback on the server. And you can do that now for any block that core comes with. Uh, the same way, a dynamic block could have a static fallback. For example, the latest post or the latest categories or latest post from a category, you could define, yes, this is a dynamic block. I can't save the latest results because they are going to change, but I can actually save a URL to the permalink for the category, and that can be the fallback. So if, for whatever reason, WordPress is not available to process this information, this is still valuable semantic data that the user, that can be shown in an email client or an RSS reader. So it's important of thinking not of static and dynamic blocks as two separate entities, but more of a continuum around the, the user experience. And this, this also relates to the, the notion of direct content manipulation, which has been uh, one of the main, main topics around Gutenberg. Um, and that is because it's not so much about how the data is stored. We have a lot of flexibility and a lot of options there. But in, to the user, those options should be as transparent as possible. That means that they should be able to directly interact with the data, even if that is being saved. If we have a site title block, of course the site title is going to be saved in the settings options. But the user should be able to manipulate it directly as any other block. So it, we shouldn't be tying where the data is stored with how the, man the content manipulation happens. Uh, I want to do a quick demo, if it works. So in the, in the last work on US, we did a, a quick uh, putting up what Gutenberg was capable at that time. And since then, one of the main things that we have added is the, uh, the columns block. The columns block allows you to have any other block within. So in this case, I have two columns with an image that's floated. I can change this. Um, I have a video within the other column. Um, you can do things like... Uh, drag elements around, let me grab. Like you can drag in and outside of the columns. And this was the, so the column blocks is where we have labeled it as experimental uh, because we have been focusing very hard on the infrastructure around columns. That is allowing any block author to specify what we call inner blocks areas. So that allows you to define any block, define an area where other blocks can live and that all integrates with this system. So the user will be able to drag and drop things inside your block, uh, reorder inside the column, um, moving up and down. And we are consuming that API for columns, but it's exactly the same API for everyone. Um, it's the, the, col the, the biggest problem with the columns block now is that it's a, it's a flat markup structure, so the front-end handling is not, is not super easy or super convenient. So we're going to be 
we're going to be iterating on how columns are presented and having wrappers around the columns by using another tool that we have at our disposal now, which are child blocks. And child blocks, what they do is they create a relationship between a parent block and these children. So let me show, see if I can do something quickly. So if I, I say, I'm going to, I have, I created a to-do, a to-do block, and I'm going to, okay. So this is part of the block API, and you just define something like parent. I am going to assign this block as a child of the columns block. So now this, this produces a few changes. First, it makes the columns block now has this uh, sort of visual representation that there's like a stack of blocks here. So when I add the columns block and I'm within the columns block, this other child block that I register appears only within this context. So I can only add this task item when I'm inside this columns block. And this is this also to, I think, another question was how do we scale the block inserter when we have, I don't know, 20 plugins registering blocks? One way is to have these sort of relationships because you can, you don't have to expose all the blocks in the root folder because some of these blocks are only relevant when they are within other blocks. And this would be useful for, I don't know, if you have a contact form block, for example. Uh, it would be useful to actually have each field as a block because then the user can reorder them. You can have the, uh, I don't know, the contact button or the send button as a separate block. Um, and all of these, like, you, you inherit, like, even with, a, with this to-do block, like, each to-do is its own block. And what that allows you to do is, like, you get for free, you get a lot of these interactions that Gutenberg offers. Uh, like dragging and drop to reorder the items, or even like mu selecting multiple items at once and reorder them. But the problem was that if you if you register a, a field like a email title, uh, email subject, uh, message content, all the separate blocks, they would just crowd the inserter with all of these mess. So the child block API is meant to sort of give some organization to that. Child blocks and nested blocks also relate to templates. Now you can define templates. Um, the, the thing we have always shown was for a custom post type. Uh, but now nest, uh, blocks can be nested within templates. So you can have a, like you can already set up, I'm not sure if I'm using it here. Yes, so here it's, I have defined a column for my template and within the column, these other elements. Like you can imagine a full site layout being built through a template and nested blocks because it only takes, it's just a list and we define which blocks belong where. So templates, nested blocks and child blocks, all of these elements were originally planned to be part of the phase two, uh, but we, we realized that uh, block authors really needed this, um, this kind of flexibility to scale and it was a good investment to get the infrastructure right even if we have a lot of work to do on our actual use of those blocks, like columns needs a lot of work, but the infrastructure is there and it's very robust and you can already use it for your own blocks. Okay. So another thing that uh, we have added is the, the Pasting that, that Matt mentioned. This is, uh, th there's been some, a, a lot of conversations around pasting um, and what should be the ideal experience. Uh, what we want to do is to always try to infer from what is being pasted, what's the right uh, block that you should be creating. In this case, if you can write a full post in Markdown and we're going to transform this to all the relevant blocks. Pasting also cle cleans up the, the, the markup source so you, you don't end up with all these spans and all these elements. Um, 
at the same time, if you do want to preserve that, you have the ability to create an HTML block and pass it into that. So one, one other thing I wanted to, to touch on is creating blocks is, well, it all happens in JavaScript. We've been saying, uh, w we've been defining all the APIs in JavaScript. And it's, for, for new people, it's not, it might be a daunting task to, uh, to sort of face all these new APIs and deal with the JavaScript ecosystem, which has, in the last few years, has grown a lot in complexity. But I think it's important to, to realize that we have a spectrum of complexity here. And, and a block doesn't, a person creating a block doesn't have to be, doesn't have to fall on the, the higher scale of the complexity. What I mean by this is that, uh, say I'm setting up a site for a client, uh, and I want to create a simple block for them to reuse in, in different places. I can, I, know, I can just create a, an HTML block and do my lovely tag. Make sure it works well. And then I can say, okay, this HTML, I want to make this that I wrote here as a block. Uh, we'll use the, the share blocks functionality for this. And now I, I, and this is represented with this icon, little icon here. Um, now this just became a block just like another, any other block in, in the share blocks library. Uh, so you can, you can set up a, a client site with 20 of these for things that you want them to be inserting but maybe not um, edit entirely. Um, and you want them to be reused across their posts. Like we've already created a block very quickly without touching code. So th there's a spectrum between setting up a whole build system for writing a complex plugin like uh, Yoast would have to do, all the way down to people like uh, setting up a site for a user and wanting these reusable bits of, of UI. And the share blocks interface allows you to preview the block. So when you hover the different blocks, you can already see what's going to be the output. And we, we, I think as a, as, as a community and as a group, we have to, to figure out what sort of solutions, how we can sort of tier these solutions so that anyone can get on board and then sort of ramp up towards more complicated use cases. Like shared blocks also work with nesting. So you could imagine having, I don't know, a lot of different blocks around a section block and make this whole thing reusable. And the, like the, the opportunities there really scale up and you, you could be doing a lot of things with that. Okay, I'm going to switch back. Or, uh, just, just to quickly hear, uh, we're already starting to see um, a lot of plugins creating blocks, which is pretty cool. And this is a plugin that adds uh, an author block that you can, and again, the, the principle here should be that everything should be, you should be able to write as much as possible within the block itself and changing the image, everything should happen uh, with, within, the, within the block itself. And, and to the user, like another thing we added was this, uh, a way to quickly know what the block is because as you imagine, once you have like a hundred blocks, that, that would become a useful thing to know um, if you need to. Like with, if, you, if you're editing the post, well one, one thing we try to do is to not show the UI. So when, you, when you're writing, we sort of fade away the UI, but once you want to start interacting with the content, it's a useful, useful representation. So I'm going to switch back. So we talk about nested templates, nested blocks, templates, layouts, and child blocks. These are the, the really the foundational pieces for the phase two, uh, but they are already, they will come, they will be available in 5.0, so you can already start using them as APIs. Uh, we, we really need uh, help testing things like uh, columns so we can get the, the experience to be uh, as smooth as possible and make sure the interface scales for every third party block author to use. So talking a bit more about the future, another 
Another important thing that uh, I think it's opening up with all these API tools is that we can now start creating sort of, they are not, they are not templates, but they are not blocks on their own. They are like these small layout units, uh, like a, an image with a paragraph next to it. So it's, it's things that you can already create by yourself, but packaging them up as these small layout units will be very useful to users so they don't have to sort of build everything through all the steps. And templates, well, another thing we added this year is the ability to lock templates down. So that means you can register a template but disable, disable the ability for moving the blocks around within the template. So it's basically a, like what you lay out in the page is going to remain there. The user won't be able to move it, but they will be able to interact and edit the content itself. And this applies, this can apply to these units as well, because nested blocks, when, when I talk about the inner blocks area, you can define templates within those inner blocks area. So it's not, the template doesn't apply to the whole page itself, it can also apply to individual areas within blocks. And these are some mockups that MelChoice did uh, around how we can uh, start introducing some of these, which is, for example, a, a three columns layout that uses the primitives that Gutenberg provides, but they are just offered as sort of quick shortcuts to get some of these layouts in place. And the other thing, like the, the, the next step that we'll have to start looking at within the next few months is right now Gutenberg is focused on the post content. Uh, the post title is not even a block, it's just a text field. And we need to turn everything into a block, the post title, the post content. We need to scale out into, so that the sidebar, the site title, the header, the menu, all of these elements becomes blocks. And this is where, this is where we can start to get to a point where the editor can actually be a faithful representation for the front end because we'll have control and we'll know explicitly by the theme, by the layouts, by the templates, how the whole page is laid out. And we already have tools that would allow you to lock certain things down. So when, if you are editing a post, maybe you don't care about the other places, but maybe you want to still see them, uh, but you don't want to be able to move the title, the site title around when you're writing a post. So all of these things are going to uh, start to be prototype and figure out for the next phases. This is also a, a, a mock-up by Mel for how the, the experience of creating a new page could be looking like. And, and this, is, this would show when you start a new page and you'll be able to either start blank or choose from these already available templates or new templates that a plugin might register. And I think I have some time for questions now. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. So we have two uh, microphones on stands here in the aisles if you want to get up. And we do have a, a couple of um, microphones that can be run down. I see some folks getting up. Go ahead and start there. Hi. Hey, thanks for the great presentation. I'm Ville from Finland. Um, I have a question about the, the author block you had on the that was made with the plugin. Uh, if you were to create a page that queries all the posts made by a certain author, what would be the approach to save the data so that it's queryable from another page? So uh, can you explain uh, uh, again the, what would you be querying? You, you want to query the, the, the author from another post? Um, I, I want to create a page that displays all the posts made by an author. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, th that would be similar to how the latest post works now. So we we have the blog latest post, and this has some like you 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 could have like an author field here, or or maybe even on the blog itself. And this is using the some tools that Gutenberg provides, uh, like around our data layer. So that you can, you don't have to directly query things. You, the idea is that you will just specify, basically declare, I want the post from this author, and we'll orchestrate all the API requests so that 
that is fulfilled on the on the client. Does that answer the question? I, I think so. Okay. Um, maybe maybe if uh, the data is something more more dynamic and and customized, not something like that is a like uh, some some ID of some sort. So what would be the uh, data model on the post? If, if let's say you have an ID of something on the on the post uh, that is rendered as a let's say an author or, or like a product. So what would be the the best way to store the, the ID to the post itself? So if I'm if I'm understanding correctly, let me show you the latest post here. So here, like you, you can you can specify attributes for a block that could be an ID to reference somewhere else. That's actually how share blocks work. If you look at the source in the HTML for the share block in the editor, it's actually just a reference ID to the post that exists in another custom post type that's hidden away from the user. So you have that, uh, like you can get any attribute into the into the comment and then process that attribute however you want within the editor. So on the post that you create the, the, let's say, a product relationship, which you store the ID to the post meta. Yes, and, and le let me see if I can. And make so a post meta query if I want yes, to. Yes, that, I mean, we support by that by default. Like one of the attribute sources for a block can be a meta attribute. You just need to make sure that the meta attribute is exposed through the REST API, uh, so that the meta attribute has to be registered as showing REST. If you do that, the attribute is already being retrieved for you in the editor, and it just matches the attribute name. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Hello, uh, I do have a question related to metadata. Uh, I was wondering, um, in, in uh, WordPress 5, uh, will we sti able, still be able to show uh, meta boxes and things that rely on them, like um, ACF plugin? Yes, you can. I think uh, ACF already has built support for Gutenberg. Like met meta boxes are already being shown. If I go to, I don't think I have anyone register now. But if you register a meta box with a context for site, for example, it will show up in the sidebar automatically. As long as what you're doing within the meta box is something we can handle by default, that will happen like that. Um, I mean, uh, I think Tammy talked a little bit about the, our own plugin API. I have a plugin installed here that's uh, outside of the block interface, and it's, it allows me to sort of insert images into the, into the post. This is where we want some of these meta boxes to eventually move towards, but the existing ones, we want to, we are doing as, as hard as work as possible to make sure that they continue to work in the new editor. If a meta box is not supported, right now we are doing a fallback into the classic editor, so you get the, the sort of the classic editor experience. But it, it's going to be, again, like there's a lot of spectrum of what we can do with what we get. If we get a meta box we can handle, we can go to classic editor. If it's a meta box that's simpler, we can handle it in Gutenberg and we'll just either add it to the sidebar or below the post. And then if you want to actually work with native Gutenberg APIs, you can create these sort of uh, things that are going to be better integrated with a UI. Like for example, this sidebar I can, uh, we have the notion of pin items, kind of like how Chrome does. All these plugin items are shown here in the ellipsis menu, and I can the user will be able to either pin them if it's something that they use frequently, so it's always in the toolbar, um, or fade them away into the into the menu. But meta boxes will continue to work as much as possible within the constraints we have. Um, so yeah, if if there's something that that you have that's broken, please go to the GitHub repository and report the bug so we can see what we can do with it. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Hello, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, first is about the block options, like if you could click to the block there. This one? No, no, yeah, there, there are a set of options. Uh, this set is inputted through some kind of API 
it is standardized way how to input or uh, it is handled similar like in widgets? No, this is, this is definitely a different set of APIs and I can quickly show you some of that code. So we, we have a set of components and in this case, what, what gets rendered here is we call this the block inspector and that's a component that you get access to. It's, it's actually exposed, let me see. I think it's in WP blocks. Yeah, so it's inspector controls. You, it's exposed in a, in a global WP variable. Like you can use, when you use this, what's, this is what we call a portal. This is, if you render things within the inspector controls component, it's going to be magically rendered on the cyber, even though you're defining that in your render mechanism for your own block. The same way is that the toolbar itself works that way. So the, these elements here, the, like the different width for the image, these are specified, let me quickly, image block, I think this. We're, what we're using is the, the toolbar component, which I can't find right now. It's just a component that you use in your render method and you can put all the, the tools inside and those are going to be rendered here. This allows us think, to do things like show this option here, like the fixed toolbar to top. This just moves all the block controls to the top, but it doesn't require you as a block author to change anything in your code because you're just declaring how your toolbar should appear. I can't find it here. This is too small. And this is just, ag again, another component that WordPress would offer. Um, and it, it allows you to, you, you can put whatever you want in a tool, but right now we have a set of tools that you can already consume, like alignment buttons, but you can put your own buttons there to process your own block attributes. Uh, but all of these are not, uh, it's what we call like declarative APIs. So you compose them, you basically have your block element, and within that you say, these are toolbar, these are block inspectors, and you don't concern about where these are going to be displayed in the UI because Gutenberg will handle that. And the idea for that is that once we move into supporting the mobile apps, you don't have to change anything in your code because the mobile apps could interpret inspector controls however it fits to the mobile application, but you have already stated from a block author perspective what should be the intention for the block. Okay, and my second question is, uh, will the columns have uh, responsive settings like for a breakpoints and push, pull and overlap? Uh, it depends on how we implement the wrappers, but yes, for sure. Um, we're considering allowing you to resize in the interface. We'll probably implement the new columns with Flexbox, so, and, and then it's very simple to make it scale to mobile that way. Uh, how, how much, what should be the interface for doing that, uh, for the user, to allow the user to configure that, that is going to be something that uh, we have to explore, uh, particularly for the columns block, but I can imagine um, different ways of approaching the allowing users to configure that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Patrick, let's take another question from this side and then we'll move over to that. Hi there, so you were talking about um, child block earlier. Uh, I was just wondering if there was a way to prevent block from being used as a child block. Um, if you wanted to say prevent an image being used but give the, give the user the option to just fill in text. So the, the inner blocks component, which is the one that defines the nested area, has a property called allow blocks. Mm -hmm. So you can specify which should be the blocks allow for that block. So that's, what, so that's how we're going to build the columns block. It's going to be a columns wrapper. Each individual column is going to be a child block, but we're going to make that the columns wrapper only accepts columns block. 
So you, you can't add like an image before you add a column and stuff like that. So it, that's supported through the allow block types um, in, the, in the inner blocks itself. Okay, great, thanks. Hey, uh, this is quite technical. Um, is there a way for parent blocks to influence child blocks? I have a concrete use case in mind. I want to A-B test, and this involves having something that's essentially columns, but then some dice get rolled and only one of the columns is displayed on the front end. This is bare bones. Right now, as far as I understand, I can't do that because I would need to have um, the render function of the AB block decide which of its, uh, which tree path of its children to render or not. And that seems impossible right now. Am I understanding things correctly? Uh, l let me walk through the example a little bit. So you have, you want to display one or another column based on some conditions that the, the is the parent controlling the condition? Yeah, so I would say insert an A-B testing block with a 50-50 probability of displaying either this or that variant. Yeah, yeah, that, that seems possible to me. The, I, I mean, it's, you don't have to control the children for that, like the children is accessible there. And if you want to exclude them, uh, you can exclude the whole, the whole child tree from being rendered based on that condition on the server. If, that's, if the A-B test uh, attribute is being accessed on the server, you can exclude that sort of tree node for the column that you, want to that you don't want to render. Ah, okay, that's great. That answers my question. I just need to find the code now. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you. Also good to hear that the child blocks and columns are being worked on so much because I think I've run into every bug with those guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you speak a bit about the, the roadmap for the design principles and the kind of, uh, there's one thing that hasn't been, I haven't seen too much about is uh, how we should be approaching the UI in an ideal world. Like when should something go into the, the block settings? When should something yep. be a toolbar, that kind of thing? Yeah, so Joen and Tammy have, have worked a lot in, in setting some of those guidelines. Uh, not, not, all, not all of those have become super visible because there's already, I mean, there's already a lot packaged into Gutenberg now. So it's like the next few steps are going to be very much focused on documentation because there's a lot you can do, but not all of this is visible or as visible as it should be. In the case of the design, the sort of the guiding principle has been that anything that's a primary action should go in the block itself or the block toolbar. And anything that could be considered secondary should go in the sidebar. That, that's a bit up to uh, interpretation. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing what works best and what works that doesn't work that great once we get it in front of more users and we're going to be refining that process. I think another example would be the style variations. Uh, style variations, you can do some of those now by just uh, registering an attribute as a class name and offering this in the sidebar. Uh, but we're thinking of making this a first class API so you can access them more prominently. I, and by uh, block styles, I mentioned things like, uh, like the quote here, So th this has like two styles right now. You can have this small, small style here and this other style. This, has, this was an experiment to see how, how we could have alternative styles. We want to make this a, a first class API so you can register any alternate style for a button, a gallery, whatever. Um, and this is something that probably should live within the block itself. It's not a secondary, secondary action. So th there, there's going to be, a, I think there's going to be a process around while well, we figure out what exactly should go where. Um, I think it's important that we hear back from people building real sites for people, agencies, clients, whatever, um, so that we can hear what's working and what isn't working well, so we can refine those principles. Cool, thank you. Thank you for the question. Just barely enough time for one final question. Go ahead. Hi there. 
Um, I have a question regarding theme development. Um, it seems that uh, with all these with, with all these blocks, uh, we are given a lot of possibilities to create beautiful designs. And as a theme developer, um, I'm curious if there are gonna be some guidelines, restrictions, and um, are there already saying if uh, we can create blocks within themes or we can sh uh, keep them in plugins, if we can create uh, page templates or templates uh, and stuff like that? Yeah, I think that the, the general sentiment is becoming to be that a theme should not be creating their own blocks and a plugin should be doing that so that it's you can switch themes and still preserve the blocks. And the theme should be more concerned with defining templates and this nested structure using already available blocks. Um, I think there's still some, like if you really need a specific use case, I think it's totally fine for a theme to register that, that block for itself. You can also consume custom blocks in templates, of course. So you can sort of mix those things together. Um, but a lot of this is going to sort of become more clear as we move into customization because they are themes, they might get away with just using the core block for a header image, but maybe they want to change that slightly or have a, a slightly different interpretation of that. And we need to figure out if that's, uh, that's sort of extending our core blocks or if the theme should be supplying their own. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's get another round of applause for Matias. Thank you. What an exciting you. evolution for WordPress and content editors.